Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. Looking forward to talking to everybody. Krista's going to help me out a little bit again. And uh, I see that Krista's watching. That's nice. One of the things that uh, we're going to go over are uh, just different concepts we've learned in school. And we're going to review a little bit of last week. And I don't know if anyone's noticed, but I've been having to... I'm such a media darling now that I have to get my hair done ahead of time. A little makeup here and there. I've been having to... Uh, decline a lot of media requests as well as I've been bombarded with uh, marriage proposals. Um, no, no death threats, but mainly just a lot of uh, media requests and marriage proposals. We're going to let people come on. And let's turn up the volume. How's the volume now? Is that volume better? Krista, how's that volume? Vince says he couldn't hear me. Can you hear me now, Vince? Alex, nice to see you. I can't really see you. How, how is the volume? Anybody uh, give me some feedback on that? Sounds good to Krista. All right. Vince, thanks for coming. We'll get started in another minute. If y'all have any, uh, <laughs> Vince, volume good, still can't hear. Vince needs to work on his hearing. <laughs> there might, might, maybe it's something on your end. So anyway, um, let's do this. Well, the topic today is concepts we learned in high school and that apply to tennis. And what I'm going to do in the beginning is I'm going to just do a quick review of the last couple of weeks. So as everybody probably knows, my name is Thomas Johnson. I'm the director of tennis at Sea Colony. I've been working there for about 10 years. Uh, before that, I was the director of tennis at Wintergreen Resort. And before that, I was a college tennis coach for 10 years. Got my master's in sports psychology and did all my doctor work in sports psychology. Um, one of my favorite things is working with people on the mental side of the game, specifically, you know, tactically and mental toughness wise. So uh, the last couple of weeks, we really went over three main things. One was routines, the value of routines, uh, the concept of redefining success, and then also how to uh, play to win versus not playing to lose. So real quick on the routines, a typical tennis match lasts about an hour and a half and you only play tennis for about 20 to 30 minutes. So assuming that uh, you're playing a match and you're completely equal with your opponent, the person who manages their time best between points is gonna really probably win that match. So if uh, Alex and Josh are playing each other in singles and they're even, and Josh is better between points, then we give him the advantage. If Alex is better between points, we give Alex the advantage. So there's a, we call them the four R's to help you stay in the moment, to help you play one point at a time. And the first R is you review. The second is you, I mean, the, the first R, excuse me, is you release the last point. The second R is you review the last point. The third is you re-strategize, you keep doing the same thing. And then the fourth is doing your ritual. Uh, the ritual phase is the most common thing that you can actually see. Um, so you'll see Steffi Graf, you know, or, or Monica Sellis or Maria Sharapova or any of these players, Agassi, do exactly the same thing between points. Nadal's clearly a great example. Um, now, redefining success is a, is a great way of taking pressure off yourself. And, and the way you redefine success is you control things you can actually control. There's not a lot of them out there. Weather's out of your control, your opponent's out of your control, but what is in your control uh, is how you manage yourself between points and how you define what success is. One way of, de of defining success strategically is the four quadrants. 
and we talked about this in depth, but imagine a window pane with, with four different uh, windows, and the top left is you did the right thing right. So you chose the right shot, and you hit it in, so you executed it well. Uh, a window pane, another window pane is you chose the right thing, but you didn't execute, and that's absolutely fine. I mean, you're choosing the right thing, it's, you controlled it. Um, another is you chose the wrong thing, but you actually hit a winner. So now, unfortunately, you're getting reinforced for doing the wrong thing, but you did it right. And the problem is now you tend to break your percentages and you try to do this, you know, again. And after a while, the percentages just, you know, work, work against you. And the, the quadrant you want to avoid, of course, is you chose the wrong thing and you didn't even hit it in. So you did the wrong thing wrong. And that would be, you know, someone hit a, re hit a serve out wide to your forehand instead of choosing the right shot going back cross court, you decide to go down the line and you missed. Um, the third concept that we talked about was how to play to win versus playing, not playing, you know, not playing to lose. And probably the biggest thing that came out of this is really you want to have a plan for how you're going to handle every single situation. So, for example, when I was coaching at Virginia, if someone was ahead 40-30, we had a rule. They had to serve in volley. Or if they got a short ball that landed on the service line, they had to come in. And the reason we did this is when you're ahead, people tend to get tentative. And then they start playing not to, not to lose. And instead of playing their game and staying aggressive, for example, they'd hit that ball that landed inside the service line and they just retreat back. So you want to have a plan for all these different situations. So if you're down and you relax a little bit and you get aggressive and you couple that with the person who's ahead getting a little tentative, things even out again. So that's just a quick review of what we were doing the last couple of weeks. Um, a couple of questions came up that I haven't been able to get to. Uh, Raquel Stella and Karina Lopez both asked a couple of really good questions that relate to each other. And Raquel wanted to know a drill to do inside the house, inside the house, and Karina wanted to do wanted to ask me how to maintain her game at home. Well, a, a couple of uh, a couple of those things would be you can do a lot of shadow tennis inside uh, if you're if you can clear out your garage, you can move around and do some fitness exercises. The thing I would advise the most is keep the ball in your racket. So there's a lot of different uh, drills you can do with your racket and a ball uh, just outside or maybe in your garage. You, know, if you, you don't want to break the furniture, of course. So, you know, there's a lot of trick shots that um, Alex and Josh have been doing. Uh, Josh did a pickleball one underneath in a garage. Alex has been doing some trick shots, and there's a variety of things you can do. The most important I would do would be to start shadowing my strokes and practice my strokes in front of a mirror. Okay, so from a technical perspective, you can do that. From a mental toughness perspective, I would highly, highly recommend starting to do some visualization exercises or some imagery. Um, you probably do this anyway. You imagine yourself playing good tennis, um, I used to do this a lot when I went to sleep because I was, I was pretty relaxed. Uh, the best time to do it is to find some time alone, some quiet time. And I used to prepare for matches like this, uh, you know, go be by myself, close my eyes, imagine myself playing great points. These visualization drills you can use for anything from, you know, how to handle yourself in a difficult situation. You can do it from a technical perspective. Uh, you can... Do it from any kind of situation you think of, so you prepare yourself and how you're going to handle it if it's really windy. But the point is to imagine yourself, you can shadow stroke, imagine yourself playing great points, uh, imagine yourself dealing with a, a difficult opponent who questions your calls and how you're going to handle it. But those are uh, some things you can do. Um, I think the most important thing at home is figuring out a way of keeping the ball in your racket. That would be one thing. And then back to your imagery. You can also do some fitness exercises. It's very, very important, especially now that we're not getting to play very much. Um, there's a variety of exercises that I've been showing on Mondays on Facebook and YouTube on different specific tennis exercises you can do. Um, on this Thursday, Mike Pitts from the Fitness Center and I are going to do another Facebook Live at 
2 o'clock this coming Thursday, and we're going to talk about injury prevention in tennis, and we're also going to talk about injury rehab in tennis. And Mike's an expert, so I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions how to deal with like tennis elbow or, or your shoulder um, going out, or maybe you've got your lower, your lower backs bothering you, and we're going to go over things like that. The uh, Another thing that's come up over the past few weeks are a variety of books. People have been submitting different books, giving me ideas, and I'm going to go over, uh, I think po Chris is going to post them all, but there's five really good ones, and there's, you know, I'd, what I'd really like to do is have people post even more and tell us what they are reading and how they apply to tennis or sports psychology and mental toughness. Um, anything to do with fitness and nutrition and tennis, we'd really appreciate it. But five of the books that are, are my favorites are Winning Ugly, uh, a book called Zen in the Art of Archery, uh, Inner Game of Tennis, of course. Um, the um, Let's see, what if I click that, Krista, what happens? Oh, Golf is Not a Game. Yeah, I, I did it. I touched the screen and nothing blew up. Uh, Golf is Not a Game of Perfect uh, by Bob Rotella. He was my advisor at Virginia. He's probably the biggest sports psych, psych guy in the, uh, in the world, or at least he was uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and then Man's Search for Meaning, a book by Viktor Frankl, which is awesome. It's all about uh, you have control over your situation. So those are some great books. And if you'd want to, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you post some more. So that kind of gets us to this week. And... I was thinking about the other day, and I was like, gosh, you know, I actually miss school. I, I really enjoyed school. And there's a lot of things I learned in school that apply to tennis. And, of course, I didn't realize it in high school. But after I started coaching more and teaching more, I started to realize that there was a lot of concept, concepts in school that I actually use now. Um, and I'm going to go over a few of them. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is rate times distance problems. I don't know if y'all remember these, but uh, there was a, uh, a train coming towards you and another train coming, and they'd come together, and you do the formula, and if they came together, there wasn't much time. They got to each other pretty quickly. The other example was one train would be going one way, the other train would be starting a little bit afterwards and trying to catch up to the train, and we'd see, Connie, check, with, uh, check in the comments. Krista uh, says how you can hear me. Um, and then the, the trains, it takes a long time to catch up to a train. Now, the reason this applies to tennis is I started noticing it initially when I was teaching beginners. And so they'd be on the baseline, I'd feed them a ball, and the very first thing they do is they would take three or four steps towards me. And so I'd hit the ball, the ball's going towards them, they'd basically run towards me three or four steps. Now they're inside the baseline and they don't have any time. And y'all know I love my rhymes. And so I started hearing myself say, don't be late, wait. I wanted to wait for the ball was going to get to them. It was going to get to them. They just didn't know it. Okay, so that, that came up. Another uh, example at a, maybe a higher level is if you watch someone at the professional level serve, the ball is going to go, let's just say, 120 miles an hour. The returner, and this is a big myth, a lot of people think the returner should always be moving forward. Well, at that level, and it's all relative, if the ball's coming to you at 120 miles an hour, you're not going forward. You might go side to side. You might go a little on a diagonal, but you're not going to go forward because you don't have any time. So if Alex can serve like 115 miles an hour, Josh can serve up there too. If you move forward on their serves, you're going to be late. So once again, you need to wait. The ball is going to get to you. Now, if the ball is going 25 miles an hour, for gosh sakes, move forward. It, no big deal. You've got plenty of time, and you can start up. You can even start up closer. I would recommend, even in this situation, find the right place so you don't have to be moving forward when you're hitting the ball. So you're just taking a step or two. It's a lot easier to get rid of all those variables. Um, poaching. This also applies to poaching. When you poach, you're taught to poach off a of ball from the center. The reason being is the ball's coming back towards the returner. Say we use serving as an example, I poach off a, off a serve. The ball's coming straighter back, and so it's easier for the net person to intercept the ball. If you serve out wide, the return is going on a diagonal away from you. 
And there's a lot of times you'll move and you feel like you can get it, but the ball is literally running away from you and you can't catch up to it. So back to the train examples when we were kids, the train is going one way, you're literally following that train, trying to catch up to it, you can't get there. And it feels, the problem is it feels like you can get there. With that being said, there's nothing black and white. Sometimes you do poach off a wide ball and it works great. Problem is the law of averages and percentages. It, and I see this and Alex and Josh and I see this all the time when we're doing our camps, is people poach off a wide ball they get to the ball, but it's off the edge of the racket and they can't do much with it or they miss hit it and just miss it. Um, another example of a rate times distance problem is on quick volley. So say you're at a quick volley uh, point at the net. If I can keep closing, I've taken away the other person's time. And this is huge in tennis. You're trying to figure out a way of taking away people's time. Um, if you watch a lot of professional tennis, Roger Federer is a genius at this. He plays up close on the baseline and he's got great hands and he's able to take the ball on the rise and take away his opponent's time. You'll see uh, Andy Roddick used to be way behind the baseline and he was giving people all, all day long. And thank goodness he had a huge serve. Uh, it used to drive us crazy to watch him that far back. Uh, clearly, he was a, a great competitor because he would still obviously was still in the top 10 in the world and won a Grand Slam. So. Can't, can't, can't criticize him too much. So those are just a few examples with rate times distance problems. And I'm sure you can think of, think of some more. So if you have any comments on that, we'd really appreciate it. So we can share that with other people. Um, the second one is, is uh, good old Newton's three laws of motion. Well, one of them, was, is often stated as an object at rest tends to stay at rest and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. The other is uh, force equals mass times acceleration. I'm sounding very academic now. And the third is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now I'm a layman, I won't pretend to understand all these things. They're pretty complicated. Uh, my friend R Roy and Bob, and the math guys, I'm sure they can figure these out. But the one I like a whole lot is an object in motion tends to stay in motion. And to me, a lot of times, that's your footwork. So if you're already moving, you can move. It's very, very difficult to go fast if you're standing still. And you'll see this as levels progress. So for example, a beginner will take about one to two steps between shots. So they'll hit their shot, they'll kind of go boom, boom, and then they'll pause and basically stop moving. And then they have trouble getting to the next ball for a couple reasons. One is they've stopped moving, so they can't move. And two is their anticipation skills really aren't there yet, so they don't know where the ball is going. So if you go up the ladder in level, you'll see a beginner taking one to two steps. You'll, take, you'll see a 3-0, 3-5 player taking about four steps between shots. So boom, boom, take about four shots. Then they get stationary. A 4-0 to 4-5 player will start taking about six steps. And then once you get past the 5-0, I mean the 4-5 level, you'll see people taking eight steps between shots. So that's, that's the goal is to take eight to 12 steps. The pros, clearly, they don't stop moving. The only person I ever saw stop moving was Andre Agassi, and his anticipation skills were uncanny. And he had also hit balls so well that his opponent was kind of stuck doing what he wanted them to do. So he had already, already had moved over, so where they were gonna hit it. But other than that, those pros are taking 12 steps probably between shots. Uh, at Sea Colony in our camps, we, we call it take six steps. So six steps, we like that because of the alliteration. You know, I'm big on that kind of stuff. Diana, and then there's Rafa. There's always Rafa. So six steps between shots is, is a good goal. And then once you can do six and you can count them out, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then hopefully you can get up to eight. And you'll probably notice that your level of play improves as your, as your movement between shots. Um, Newton's law also comes into play with power. So we'll use serving as an example. People ask me all the time, how do, I hit this, how do I hit my serve harder? How do I get more power? And I say, I don't mean to be a smart ass, but you know, you swing faster, the ball is going to go faster. So there's been all sorts of studies now. And uh, I'll tell people, hey, swing faster. So we'll do some different drills and how to swing faster. 
Now, the, there's some great examples on YouTube where people are serving from their knees and they're serving like 90 miles an hour from their knees. So they're not using their legs. It's all racket speed. So whoever swings the fastest, once again, is gonna hit the fastest. And there's one video I'm thinking of in particular, uh, the person on their knees, they hit a 90 mile an hour serve from their knees. Now they having trouble hitting it in obviously because they're on their knees. But then they stand up, they start using their legs correctly and they get about 10%, 15% more power. Now their serves up to about 100 miles an hour. So when people say, oh, I need to use my legs more for power, they're right. But that's not where your primary power comes from. It comes mainly from racket speed. How fast can you make that racket move? And that becomes the challenge. So there's lots of drills you can do uh, trying to get that racket speed to get a little bit higher. You can get physically stronger. You can put a weight on your racket and practice like that. Uh, we do a, a drill at Sea Colony where you make your racket whoosh through the air without hitting it. So you hear that whooshing sound through the air. If you can hear that whooshing sound, you can um, predict that now, now I'm, I'm going to serve a little faster. Um, so those are some uh, good examples of that. The, uh, I was uh, reading and your the third, the third law is the, uh, equal and opposite reaction. So that's really your body on the court. So when you push off the court, you're going the opposite direction. You're not going down when you push. So you push down, obviously the, the court doesn't give that much. And now you're, you're, you're moving. And which is one reason I showed the, uh, fitness drill with uppers. And I did a, a fitness a couple of, a couple of Mondays ago, and I'm stepping up, raising my leg and practicing my stroke. And I'm practicing explosion so I can develop more uh, quicker movement on my first step. So this uh, uppers or uh, some people call them step ups, but you step up and you step up and burst up and that increases your, uh, hopefully your speed as, uh, as well as your strength. So there's just a few examples of how Newton's law got to us. So I, I love this stuff, but the uh, a bit a bit more uh, applicable to all of us is the law of averages. Now we talked a couple of weeks ago about um, average shots. You know, so how many shots is an average point? So at the pro level, it's about three and a half shots for men and women. At the high school level, and I should say in singles, it's about three and a half. In doubles, it's about three point two shots. At the high school level, two shots for boys, two. 2.5 shots for the girls. So this makes me think that, you know, if you know the average, you can be a little bit mentally tougher. Because if you don't know the average, where are you gonna go? So everything's a little bit interrelated. The average rally length in, um, in singles, like I said, is about 3.5. Now the most common rally length is how many shots? One. The most common rally is one shot. It's a serve. It shows you how, mo how important the serve is. The most common point, second most common point, is three shots. So once again, the serve, then the return. Now the third is two shots. So it makes you start to think, well, maybe we're not even practicing correctly. Maybe we should be practicing serving and returning even more. Because if the most common points are one, then three, then two, maybe we need to start practicing a little bit differently. So one of the things I've been messing around with is having people, instead of just, you know, they're hitting around, instead of just dropping the ball out of their hand and, and starting the rally, to hit a nice, easy, fluid serve straight down the middle to the person they're practicing with. This way, they've practiced their serve. The, re the person they're hitting the ball to is actually now hitting a return. And the biggest difference of this is a couple of things. One is now you're seeing a ball come from up high as opposed to out of your hand. So, and you get a completely different bounce. Now, probably the most, the, in my mind, and I don't know if this is statistically correct, but the least practice shot, as far as I can tell, is the return to serve. No one practices returning. Probably the great ones do, but the most important shot in tennis is probably the serve and then the return to serve. So my feeling is that when we practice and we're hitting around with people, instead of taking the ball out of our hand, dropping it and hitting it over, just taking it straight out of our hand, start hitting a nice fluid serve. You'll hit more serves this way. You develop a fluid motion. The person you're hitting with gets to hit returns. They're seeing it from a different spot. 
And um, if these are the two most important shots, why not incorporate this into our practice sessions? If the, if the, if the most common point is, is three and a half shots, and then the most common of that is one shot off a serve, then three, then two, then I think we may all be practicing incorrectly. Now, the problem, clearly, from a fitness perspective, if you start banging serves all the time, your arm's going to wear out. I mean, you, you, it's tough on your shoulder. And, and to back up a little bit, this is what, another reason why you do want to use your legs on your serve is it will save, save your shoulder a little bit. So those are just a couple of things uh, I was thinking about with the law of average. I highly recommend you learn the percentages. Um, something that's definitely related to percentages is figuring out when to change the direction of the ball. Um, probably your fundamental strategy is figuring out what ball that you can move, what ball that you can change. So the easiest thing to do in tennis is to hit the ball straight. The hardest thing to do is to figure out how to redirect the ball. So a good example is, is serving in doubles. Where do you hit most of your returns in doubles? We hit them back cross court to the server. The, this way the ball's still going straight. It's going diagonal, but it's going straight. To change the direction of the ball and go down the line off the serve is incredibly difficult to do. And there's a reason we don't do it a lot because we know it's difficult. Now the question becomes, why is it difficult? Well, I wish I could, I could show you this guys a little bit better, but if the ball comes at an angle to my racket face, boom, it's gonna deflect out basically at the same angle. We see this a lot uh, when people miss going down the line off an approach shot or they miss going the, down the line off of a cross court rally. And what we also do is we can see this if you ever play pool. When you make a bank shot, you hit it at the, into the cushion at an angle and it'll come out at the same angle unless you put a bunch of spin on it, right? So you hit it and that's the problem is the ball comes into my racket and if I leave my racket square, it's gonna deflect out at the same angle. So the challenge is, which ball are you gonna change? Now to back up and go back to our law of averages, if the average rally is only three and a half shots, and let's just say four to make the math super easy, if you can make two shots every point, the law of averages says you're gonna have a really, really good chance of winning. Now you've gotta hit a solid shot. So now we'll redefine success and go, all right, success is I'm gonna hit the ball back from where it came two times before I do anything. So I'm gonna serve, say I serve volley. I'm coming in, I make my first volley, I'm gonna go back from where they came. I'm gonna go back, right back to that returner. Now Alex talked about this when he did serve and volley the other day on one of his posts. And he talks about serving, coming in, making that first volley, and playing the point from there. So this, this concept of changing the direction of the ball is Big, very big. It's definitely a physics thing we learned, and I dismissed it at the time because I, you know, was a dummy in high school and I didn't pay uh, pay uh, pay much uh, much attention to it. Um, now, the change of direction is probably harder in certain ways. So, if someone goes down the line and I change the direction, that's easier than changing the direction of the ball off of a cross court shot. So the reason it's harder off of a cross court is you tend to be moving a little bit to your, say it's a cross court forehand that you're dealing with and you're right handed, you tend to be moving a little bit to the right. So the ball is gonna go in the same direction that you're going. I don't know if you're little, you, you could walk and you could drop a ball and it would stay with you. Well, same concept. If you don't swing through the ball at all, it's gonna hit your racket and deflect out and go wide. If you accelerate through it, the ball's gonna go down the line and you're gonna be able to straighten the ball out. It's easier to go cross court off of the down line than it is to go down the line off a of cross court. Probably the hardest thing to do is if someone, if you're at the, maybe not the hardest, but very difficult, if you're at the net, someone goes cross court to your backhand volley and you try to redirect that into a down the line. That's incredibly difficult because now you're going inside out and even your technique starts to break down a little bit. If you can take a forehand volley, then that's easier. It's more natural, it's going across your body. So it's a little bit more natural. So if you have any questions on this change of direction, get in touch with Josh, get in touch with uh, Alex. In a few weeks, Josh is gonna talk, talk about that on his Friday fireside chat. 
Um, I'm, a, I'm thinking that he's going to go in detail with that, so that really helps. You could also refer back to Alex's video. Um, and now start, you know, watching some old tapes of, of tennis matches on the Tennis Channel, and you'll start to see that, you know, those guys change and those gals change the direction, but most of their errors are when they change the direction of the ball from a cross court into a down the line for a variety of reasons. Another concept that we uh, experienced in, uh, in high school algebra, oh my God, algebra, I was actually good at algebra, is all these variables. You know, so a typical uh, question when we were little bitty was three plus two equals five. So we got that one down. Then you got a little bit older and they said X plus three equals five. And you started to figure out that, not too difficult, X plus three equals five. You know, now pretty easy, two plus three equals five, you figure that one out. High school algebra started getting more difficult when they put multiple variables into, a, into an equation. So then we started getting to all these weird quadratic formulas and stuff that people like Bob Elliott and Roy Zatkoff know forwards and backwards, and you have all these variables, they can still figure out the answer, I'm lost. But I do know that when I'm teaching people, I need to decrease the amount of variables I'm getting them to think about. So the last thing I want to do is go, okay, get in your ready position. Now flex your knees, get on the balls of your feet. Now when the ball comes, I want you to step out with your right leg and open up so you can move to your right. Oh yeah, I want you to turn your shoulders, get your racket back, set your racket up a little bit high so you can take it back and hit topspin. Oh yeah, but then you've got to time the ball off the bounce. And now we see the ball going into the court and off the court at a certain rate. And now you've got to time that. And then I want you to hit the ball a couple feet in front of you. Make sure you extend all the way to your target so you can generate some, some force behind the ball. So you can give some power like old, good old Newton was talking about. Then you've got to wrap that. Uh, you should be a professor. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then um, you got to wrap that follow through around. And then without stopping, I need you to recover. Get on the back of the ball. You'll be too, way too much information. Let's just follow through. Follow through correctly. You follow through correctly, you got a chance. My point is, you don't want to be thinking. It's the old paralysis by analysis. Tennis pros are notorious for this. Golf pros are, uh, I, you know, I'm a tennis pro, so I'm, I'm a little biased. Golf pros tend to get into even more variables. The first golf lesson I ever took, the pro said, your swing's on an outside to inside plane. And it just completely overwhelmed me. And after a while, I told him, hey, what do you want me to ball to look? What do you want the ball to look like that I'm hitting? And he said, "Well, I want it to go to your left. I'm right-handed, so eventually I started figuring out a way of making it go left. Eh, got better at it. Still no good at golf. So all these variables make things more difficult. When I'm teaching, we'll we'll teach the variables. We'll teach the beginners to simplify. Right? Um, one of the uh, Examples you see on the professional tour is the different serving stances. There's three different serving stances. Uh, one's called a platform stance, and you'll see Federer stand like that. Djokovic was like that. Sampras served like that. Agassi served like that. Justine Hennen on the women's side, she served like that. Uh, the, the other most common is called a pinpoint. Nadal serves like this. Serena serves. And that's when you bring your back foot up. Uh, there's a third style that's not used very much, but it was the what I call the erotic style. Your feet would be pretty close together, and it was as if you moved that back foot up. So when I'm teaching players at the at the club level, usually I'll teach them uh, Sampras' style, Federer style. When you it's a platform serve, you've eliminated a variable, so you're not moving that back foot up. When you see people moving that back foot up. It take, the timing is much more difficult. It doesn't mean you're any more athletic if you move your back foot up. It doesn't mean you'll get more power or no more knee bend because I'd be happy with Federer serve or Agassi serve or Sampras serve. So you can't define, oh, okay, because I've had people tell me, oh, moving my foot up, I'm going to get more power. Well, Sampras' serve was huge. You know, Roddix doesn't move. It's as if he moved his foot up, but I think we'd all take uh, Djokovic's serve or Agassi's serve. Well, um, I think maybe uh, Serena serve might be the best. She does move her back foot up, but technically amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, but it does require more timing, which is why I tend to teach the platform serve as opposed to a serve that requires you move your back foot up. So another good example would be Rafael Nadal. 
Diana Kane's in love with Rafa. So he's making you deal with a tremendous amount of variables. So he's putting a ton of topspin on the ball. He's swung very fast. He's putting a ton of spin on the ball so it hits and explodes up at you. That's a big variable to deal with. He also has hit the ball very fast, so he, and he's also hit the ball very deep. So now you're dealing with the multiple of variables. He, weirdly enough, can actually make the ball curve a tiny bit, which is kind of unheard of in tennis. Usually in tennis, you're trying to shape the ball up and down or on a line or if a lob is way up, kind of like a, a bell-shaped curve. Remember that one? Uh, so a bell-shaped curve, the ball, that would be maybe a lob and trying to flatten that curve. We've all heard about flattening the curve lately. So you'll see, uh, uh, so someone's coming to the net, I'll try to make the ball dip at their feet a little bit or I'll hit it more on a line to keep the ball low. Uh, I'll lob more and try to get the ball up. So that's that bell-shaped curve or people talk about parabolas. That's a big word. Um, but the main thing is, from a teaching perspective, you want to keep your analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis, very minimal. You do not want to be giving people a lot of variables to deal with. Um, you're trying to figure out a way of decreasing the variables uh, at a higher level. So if you're playing Nadal, you don't want to be running at his shots and taking away your time and acting like you, know, you can take his shots on the rise. Now, Federer figured out a way of doing that but that's a whole nother ball game. Um, let's see. I, would, I had a couple of uh, people ask me questions uh, before I got here, and they wanted to go, uh, I heard, I had one question here that someone submitted named John from uh, Virginia. And, uh, oh, John, okay. Well, John's an old tennis buddy of mine, and he wanted me to go into more about change of direction because he's heard me talk about this a whole bunch. So I'll go in a little bit more depth. Um, when you're hitting with somebody, the ball is going straight. Okay, so if you're warming up in doubles or singles, you're going straight ahead in doubles on one half. and singles, you're going straight ahead down the middle. Uh, we do a lot of cross courts, so the ball's still going straight. Okay, so you're going down the middle. You can do your cross courts. Ball's still going straight. That's uh, fairly easy going cross court because you've got a lot more distance to work with because the court is longer on a diagonal. Also, the net is a little lower on a diagonal. If you're going straight ahead, uh, warming up on doubles, uh, the net's not super high, but it is higher down the line. Um, if you are going, um, if you, there's a drill we always do uh, in singles, and it's, we call it cross court down the line. So if someone goes cross court and I go down the line, that's pretty darn difficult. Um, especially on my side since I'm going down line. It's going, and it's difficult for a couple reasons. One is the net's higher, like I just said. My body weights, like I said a little while ago, tends to be going that direction. The angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. That's making it difficult. The court's not as long. And another variable is that you're, you're, it's not as natural of a shot to hit when you go down line. You're tending to swing away from your body a little bit more. If we switch the drill, and you go down the line, and I go cross court, that's a more natural change. It's across my body, so it's a little bit easier to do. I'm a little stronger physically going across my body. The net's a little bit lower. I've got more room you know, on a diagonal, so the court's a little bit longer, and it's a, therefore it's a safer shot. There's a reason people tell you to go cross court, so it's a little bit easier. Now, the three biggest variables are spin, speed, and depth if you're hitting cross court. So if Rafael Nadal has hit the ball deep with a lot of topspin and a lot of speed, you're kind of stuck hitting the ball back to him. So one way of thinking about this is if the ball is a difficult shot for you, then you're probably better off going right back at him. So if the ball is shorter, slower, less spin, you can redirect it. So on Josh's Friday fireside chat, uh, yesterday, he talked about hitting approach shots. And you notice he dealt with a short ball to his backhand and he was able to redirect it down the line. So one is the ball wasn't as deep, right? The ball tends to be going a little bit slower because it's landing shorter. And now when you redirect, yes, yeah, someone brought up Wardlaw's directionals. 
That's a, let's add that, Crystal, let's add that book. Uh, Chuck Creasy, uh, who was a college tennis coach for years, I coached against him when I was at Virginia, and he, and he was at Clemson, has a book called, I think, Winning Tennis. But Wardlaw's directionals go into exactly what I'm talking about. So the big three variables are spin, speed, and depth. The variables at the net are basically the same, but it's spin, speed, and height. So if you get a high volley, you can change the direction of the ball. If you get a low volley, you're probably better off going back from where it came. So the, tr the tricky thing in doubles is if you get a low volley and you choose the wrong shot and you go with the net person, now you're giving them a high volley, which they can change the direction of the ball on. So Don, thanks for bringing up Wardlaw's directionals. Uh, it's, it's very applicable to this and uh, not exactly the same way I explained it, but it's another perspective, and it's, and it's pretty uh, pretty darn good book. Uh, Chuck Creasy's Winning, I think it's called Winning Tennis. Uh, you can look him up, though. Uh, he was a coach at Clemson, and he also worked, um, I think now he might be working at the Citadel. So th that, that was the one question I really wanted to go over more in depth, because John asked it, and, uh, and uh, he uh, and I have been talking about tennis for, for ages. Um, let's see, Krista, any, uh, any questions that I should, uh, address that have come up? Um, or does anybody have any questions they want me to refer to? Um, I think, uh, the biggest advice I could give to you guys is know your percentages. Without knowing your percentages, you won't know when to break them. You've got to figure out what those percentages are. And the problem is you got to figure out which ones you can change. So back to the change of direction, maybe you don't have a very good backhand, so you shouldn't be changing the direction of the ball much with the backhand. Maybe when you get a backhand, you've, you're stuck going back from where it came. That's not bad. You know, it means maybe you need to practice your backhand more. But if you know your game, you can figure out which ball you can change. I can change my volleys fairly well, but... Um, you know, oh, Nikki, but my ground stroke, specifically going down the line at the back end, is very, very difficult. Let's see what Nikki's got. Nikki, I frequently play doubles against a team where the net players consistently poaching my cross court returns and cheating towards the middle. I tend to return serves that are wide down the line to keep that person honest. Is that wrong? Absolutely not. And I would especially do that, Nikki, in the beginning of the match. Because if you do it in the early on, early on in a match, you're going to get that person to stay a little bit, and that'll open up your cross court return. Now, what's absolutely critical in doubles is communicating. I don't know if you know it, but the pros they tell their partner where they're going to serve before every single point, what kind of spin they're going to hit. They also know whether or not they were going to poach or not. On the other end of the of the spectrum is returning. Nikki, make sure you tell your partner where you're returning. So tell them, for example, hey, I'm going on this first return I get, I'm going right at the net person, so be ready. Because you know what's going to happen. If they get anything up high, they're going to change the direction and they're going to hit it at your partner at the net. Now, if you tell them, hey, first serve, I'm going to take my return, I'm going to go hard right at them. Don't go in the alleys. Play the odds. Play the percentages. Go right at them. If you miss them, the ball ends up in the alley, Hey, that's okay. You miss them, it goes a little further cross court. That's okay. So make sure you tell them. So tell them, first serve, I'm going at them. Second serve, I'm lobbing over their head and I'm coming on in. Um, co the communication here becomes really, really important. So make sure you communicate before the serve is hit and on both sides of the equation. Um, let's see. Any other uh, question? That's a good one. Uh, Nikki, that's a really, really good question. I would like y'all, um, I like to always give homework assignment because, you know, being the professor today, uh, everybody's got to have a homework assignment. Tell me or comment what shots you can change and, or what shots you can't or email these questions and then we can respond to them next week. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is we're going to do this again next Saturday. Um, we are going to also do continue our, all of our social media posts. So Monday, I do fitness. Tuesday, we do trick shots with Alex and Josh. 
Wednesday, we do something on technique. So last Wednesday, we did the two-handed backhand. The previous week, Alex showed the one-handed backhand. On Thursday, Alex does a doubles tip. So how to serve in volley or, or you know, something more specific to doubles, a court positioning. On uh, Fridays, uh, we do fireside chats with Josh. Yesterday, he did approach shots. Uh, I'm not sure what he's going to do next Friday, but I'm sure it'll be pretty darn, uh, pretty darn interesting. And, and all these can be found on Facebook or YouTube, Sea Colony Tennis and Fitness on YouTube. On uh, Sundays, we always do a trivia question. And then on next Thursday, uh, I'm going to respond to the comment here. The, everything's on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And you can um, find them all see, on YouTube at Sea Colony Tennis and Fitness. On Facebook, it's Sea Colony Tennis. And then next Thursday, uh, with Mike Pitts, who's a trainer at um, Sea Colony Fitness, we're going to do a live Facebook at 2 p.m. next Thursday. And in it, we're going to discuss how to maintain fitness for tennis, how to deal with injuries, how to prevent injuries, and how to rehab from injuries. So uh, hopefully we'll see you there on Thursday. And... I think that probably wraps it on up. I'm going to hang out for a, a few more minutes and see if anybody posts any, uh, any more questions. Uh, Raquel, uh, you write fire. Hmm. Well, I don't know what that means. Maybe Instagram. Yep, that's definitely where we are. So if you have any questions, feel free. Uh, comment as much as you want. You can always email me at thomas.johnston at vacasa.com. That's thomas.johnston at vacasa.com, or you can comment in the comment section below. Uh, please share this with everybody out, uh, with everybody else, and um, really looking forward to seeing you guys next Saturday. Stay safe, uh, do your fitness, stay fit, practice your strokes, and uh, thanks, June. Uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing everybody on the courts at, at Sea Colony. If you're curious about when we're going to reopen, by the way, uh, we'll be posting something um, pretty darn soon. Uh, we have a, a basic plan, but we really don't know yet when we're going to open. Uh, just like everybody, we're pretty darn excited about when we're going to open, but we just don't know when yet. All right. You guys, you take care, and um, I, hope, uh, I hope to see you all next Saturday. Tell a friend. Bye-bye.